I want to talk about an important subject today. You know, a lot of the topics we talk about have to do with strategy, you know, whitetail strategy. And, um, and this ultimately does. But this one's an important one because, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversation out there and discussion about soil health, uh, weed control on your food plots. And, you know, what I do is I take a look at what I've had. I've had small tractors, no tractors, ATVs, UTVs, sprayers, handheld broadcasters, uh, PTO mono broadcasters. So coming at it from that angle, and then of course you work with clients for food plots and designing their food plots. You know, again, I've worked with over 1,200 now, uh, 1,250, whatever it's been. And then uh, Dylan, um, Kevin, Joe. So we, we interview people with food plots, landowners with food plots all the time. And, and you're always trying to balance their equipment. So I don't make recommendations just saying, you know, this is a recommendation for you to do, but you have to have a $60,000 tractor and $20,000 grain drill, a $5,000 crimper, whatever it might be. You have to have this equipment to do it right and figure it out if you don't. It's more, I want to try to provide you the concepts of what's important and make sure you have quality food plots and quality soil. I'm gonna tell you what we're doing out here. You know, one thing we do spray, uh, we use chemicals. I want you to think about what's more important, soil health or weeds, getting rid of weeds on your plots. And I wanna to try to be realistic about that. And that's what I try to do with my clients is make realistic recommendations. If you have comments on YouTube, try to make realistic expectations. For example, people say, well, you shouldn't use chemicals. You know, chemicals are bad. You, you had me right up until the time you said you're using chemicals. Well, I'll tell you, I think it's borderline foolish if you're planting food plots and you're not using chemicals. People, it sounds really cool and, and really nice that you're not using chemicals, but a lot of times it's not practical. For example, I would not own private land if I couldn't plant food plots with chemicals, if I couldn't plant food plots. And I just go hunt public land. I love hunting public land. Um, I hunt public land every year. And that way I just go find the food. I, I don't want to waste my time planting food plots and having bad food plots. And there's some mixes that you can use. For example, I could plant rye out here and I could plant buckwheat and just make rotations of that. They both have good weed suppressant properties. They both build the soil but they're going to be a terrible attraction and draw relative to what is around here um, in the area. I can do that up in the UP of Michigan, but even then there's ways you can do it better by taking control of your weeds, not letting sedge or mustard come in up, up in the UP of Michigan, uh, ferns, whatever. Um, there's things you can do to actually suppress weeds, kill weeds, and have good crops, better crops. And so you really have to take that, that balance in because if you're going to plant food plots, you're not going to control weed. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. And who has time for that? I'd rather just go hunt public land. So just getting that out of the way. But what's more important, getting rid of weeds or improving the soil, soil health? I'm going to talk about what we're doing in both of them. If you look at this food plot right here and you look at the condition that it's in currently, this food plot looked a lot like that just a few days ago. Um, this brush, you can see a little opening back there see some brush, red cedar. We cut it all down. We brush hogged it all down. And then I came in here and it's at that current state right now where I sprayed a combination of 2,4-D and glyphosate. Put that on and people say, oh, you know, glyphosate's terrible. You can need to go look at these ag fields out here. They're using 2,4-D, glyphosate, atrazine. They're using multiple pesticides to control weeds. And the deer go out there and eat on this. There's thousands of acres of ag land around here. And I'm not saying that it's right to do this because they're doing that times 10. What I'm doing is glyphosate. It's probably the least harmful herbicide that's out there, but it's the most widely used. So it gets picked on for lawsuits. And if you're one of those lawsuit type people, then you probably don't like herbicide you probably are against that it's kind of a you know conspiracy theory almost uh kool-aid swallowing the kool-aid type thing that that uh glyphosate's bad we're putting two quarts per acre glyphosate one pint per acre 2,4-D on here and we're smoking these weeds out but we're still going to have weeds after that and we'll we'll control those going in the future what we're starting with soil health is just getting the soil in a condition so that i don't have to come in here and spread three tons of lime or two tons of lime this takes the place, a two and a half gallon jug of lime. It's not a replacement for it. What it is, it's just an alternative just for this growing season. So I have to do this every single year. When we come in here and spray for 20 minutes, that's pretty easy to do. It changes the soil, not the pH. 
It changes the soil like lime does. It changes the soil so that the plants can uptake the nutrients and we can have a good crop. In this case, we're gonna have a lot of corn in here. We're gonna have a little bit of green where we have some stumps, but mostly we're gonna have corn in here. We'll be able to do that this year, having this. In fact, the corn's going in on Monday. It's currently Friday while we're shooting this. This was ground down just on Wednesday. We sprayed it and we're getting corn in here. Then we'll still have to control the weeds in the future. Now, corn takes from the soil. It's the biggest and largest contributor of organic matter, corn is, back in the soil, especially when we're not harvesting it. But at the same time, it takes the most nutrients. So easy to rotate with buckwheat during the summertime. And a lot of our green plantings, we're, we're using buckwheat during the summertime. Buckwheat is a natural, great soil builder. It's a weed suppressant at the same time. So it limits the amount of chemicals. I'm all for limiting chemical use any way I can. And so buckwheat takes the place of a spring that you'd have to have. Most importantly though, we're doing this on no-till. So one of the ways we improve the soil is you look on the ag fields around here. I don't know if Gunner will have the time. Gunner's actually filming instead of Dylan today, but I don't know if Gunner will have the time, but there's a lot of erosion that went on last night. We had a big giant rain because you have open soil plots with corn that was one to two inches tall and it just rushed right off the fields. A lot of areas flooded, a lot of really bad erosion. And it was because those those fields are freshly tilled. We'll never till this. We'll never plow this, we'll never disc it, we'll never till. So when you till, you open up the soil for erosion and all your great topsoil ends down in the bottom of the ravine. That's not good soil health. That's the way you have to do it for farming a lot of the times because they're looking at big, large areas that they can't meticulously manage at a higher expense because it all relates back to the expense and how much money they're going to make when they sell these crops. It's, it's how they make a living. You know, farming is a great hard way of life and they have to be efficient with their dollars. When we're planting these smaller food plots here, a lot of times they're spending a lot more money on these food plots to improve the health of the soil and get the highest yield per acre out of here, including chemical control, so that we can ultimately have the best crop for the wildlife that are in the area and get the most out of our effort. We're starting in the red already when we're planting food plots. We're not harvesting this. Farmers have to stay in the black. We're in the red already. So when we're adding more red to it by doing things like adding wheat or rye to your corn in the fall, overseeding or in the spring. That might not be cost effective for overall farming, but it is effective for food plotting and improving your soil. But what we're doing is no-till. And so by not coming in here, disking, plowing, tilling, then we're not opening our soil up to the risk of erosion. You'll find even though this is burned down, there's a lot of soil exposed within these crops. You're not gonna find erosion out in this field at all. And you won't in the future either, because we're gonna make sure we have crops in here to hold that soil. We're not, also we're not drying out the soil. We're not allowing this topsoil layer to, to continually be disc over, tilled over to get rid of weeds and then drying out that top layer and destroying that top layer. So we're always working on this topsoil in here. We're not drying it out. We're not opening it up for the risk of erosion. And of course, we're getting rid of the weeds. So very important, you know, a lot of times we're putting, again, that buckwheat rotation in the summertime, wheat and rye in the corn in the spring, and then we're dis we're uh, no tilling into it. By not disking, by not tilling, by not plowing, there's huge advantages to the soil there. We're always putting that organic matter back in. Look at it back in the day, rotating rye, rotating buckwheat, that was a soil builder that people would build for new soils. It's easy to do with small equipment. You know, a lot of these soil builders, buckwheat's the only thing you're gonna crush with your tires, with your side-by-side -side tires, your tractor tires, with a lawn roller. We use a Packer Max called a packer which is a great tool it crushes nothing else crushes like that we've tested everything i started using buckwheat and crushing that overseed planting into it and if you don't use herbicide then any of the broad leaves that are down below even pigweed or whatever it might be will take over smartweed that can take over your food plots and again you don't have a food plot so you're spraying you're also spraying to keep that buckwheat down in the end herbicide even just simple glyphosate because that's not competing with your crop that you might have growing within and it can outcompete other crops. And so you're always looking at that balance of using buck, something like buckwheat for the summertime. But a lot of these soil builders that are out there, quote soil builders, you have to till in or disc in. That requires you to have a tractor and it requires you to dry out the soil, destroy that top layer. And so do things that are actually damaging to your food plot in the name of planting the soil builder. It's almost counterproductive, if that makes sense. So we're trying to take all those balances of what equipment you have, what to recommend. And so on one hand, 
there's several ways. We use a high percentage of tillage radish in Nebraska blend. I actually add more tillage radish and subtract other things out of there so that we can actually add a higher percentage of tillage radish because tillage radish is a great soil builder. So very high percentage of tillage radish, plus deer love it. They love the radishes, they eat the greens early, they eat the radish way earlier and they do purple top turnips. So it actually puts nutrients back into the soil. So by buckwheat, by adding tillage radish, we have other areas where we're adding medium red clover at 10 pounds per acre with a brassica mix in the fall to try to build soil and build the deer herd. We don't need to build the deer herd here. So there's always these balances you have to consider. So we're taking several steps whether it's not drying out the soil, not disking, not creating the erosion like all these ag fields that happened last night. Unfortunately, we had flooding again. We have road, part of our road is washed out from last night, let alone these ag fields around here that were just freshly disc and planted. I feel bad for some of these farmers around here and some of the ag land. And then we're adding nutrients back into the soil. Tillage radish, rye and wheat combinations, buckwheat during the summertime. So a lot of ways you can improve the soil at the same time and that's limiting, her limiting herbicide use. And then of course we're, we're using herbicides. You know, weeds are not good during the summertime. People say weeds, deer eat the weeds during the summertime. They do, it's more diversity in the food plot, but all those weeds die going into the fall. There's no attraction value there and they're just taking the nutrients from your food plot. If you have 50% weeds in your plot, you don't have 50% the volume going into the fall, you have 10% the volume, 20, because they take nutrients, they take up space, and they basically eat your good crops, nutrients out of house and home. So you have nothing left. So that's why it's so critical to actually control your weeds and really try to do that. So we're limiting the weed use when we can, but I wanna make sure that if this is an acre and a quarter field, which that's about what it is, then I wanna make sure that we're getting an acre and a half of whatever I plant in here. I don't want weeds in here, I hate weeds. But there's ways you can do it and improve the health of, the, of your soil at the same time. That's what I try to do here. You know what, the tactics that I use for food plotting, I've written about it, I have food plot books out there, food plot web class. First started writing uh, food plot articles back from Michigan out of doors a long time ago, 15, 16, 17 years ago. Quality whitetails for the QDMA, that's where I published a lot of my early food plot work back in the 2000s, long time ago, 2003, 2004, and quality whitetails, and before that in Michigan Outdoors and other publications. All this experimentation that I did, so you don't have to. And that's what I'm just trying to do, is make sure you get it right. You know, in the end, What's more important, weed control, the health of your soil, soil quality, both are. You shouldn't sacrifice one to have the other. But I can tell you, if you're not practicing soil, uh, soil improvement, you're not practicing weed control, then your plots are gonna suffer. And I go to so many food plots that are overtaken by weeds every single fall. It's a huge waste of time. And on that private land, you're not gonna have anything else that'll attract the deer to that parcel more than a food plot and allow you to build a herd. It's not your deer, but you can build a local herd that you can have on your land that focus on your land during the daylight every single day. If you're using poor plantings because you think you're helping the soil, if you're using poor plantings because you think you're limiting weeds at the expense of a fall attraction, you know, bought the land, most people bought their land to help with deer, to actually grow a deer herd and to actually enjoy their land and have a great hunt. A lot of people are destroying their hunt, destroying their ability to have a great herd simply because they're using tactics for soil control or weed control that are simply ineffective or create an ineffective food plot, which therefore destroys your ability. Because if I don't have food plots out here, I can have the neighbors, which already do plant food plots a quarter mile away, I'll have no deer. I'd rather they have good food plots, I have good food plots. Now you both have a herd on your land that you can actually look at, have some sort of control because deer only travel two to 400 yards, a mature buck does. He's gonna travel the furthest. He's got a home range several times more than a doe family group. He's going to actually be able to focus on your food every single day if you have quality food that's weed free. He can do that here in a small package during the daylight. And then at night, he expresses the other 95% of his home range. We're only worried about during the daylight. So if we're doing that here, neighbors are doing that a half mile away over there, a mile away, they can develop a great daylight herd. We can develop a great daylight herd over here. There's not a lot of overlap when it's that far apart. Yes, bucks travel a long ways, but not during the daylight. And if you learn tactics that improve your soil, get rid of your weeds and produce quality plots, 
then you can greatly limit how far mature bucks travel during the daylight. You can build a quality herd. And without any of that, without good soil control, without good weed control, without having quality food plots on your private land, you're just hoping for one to pass by and plant some fruit trees and spend a lot of time on your food plots, wasting a lot of time and a lot of money. Make sure you do it right this growing season. It's something we've practiced for a very, very long time. If you have any questions about this, a lot of these tactics I wrote about in my first food plot book, it was published in 2014. A lot of these layering techniques with buckwheat, planting soybeans into standing wheat or rye, for example, we go over in chapter 12 of my 2014 food plot book, let alone my food plot web class and all the food plot videos that we have on, on YouTube. I think we, on YouTube, we have about 200 food plot videos in the food plot playlist out of almost a thousand videos. And so a big chunk, most of them are white tail strategy related, some type of, I mean, the rut, hunting nocturnal box trail cameras, whatever it might be, we cover every white tail ta topic. But there's a large, por large portion on there that cover these food plot practices. And if you like reading more than watching videos, then uh, check out my website. We have over 600 articles that I wrote on my website over the years, and a large portion of those, 20-25%, are food plot related. So I've been talking about and preaching those for a long time, I'm trying to teach you. Bottom line is I just want, based on your equipment, for you to make good decisions with your food plots this fall. And again, what's more important, weed control or soil quality? They're both important, and there's ways you can do both and have great food plots going into this season. And for that, have a great hunt and experience a great herd this fall. Now I'm excited again this year to host our Camp Kicking Bear charity event. Last year we did it in June and it was a big success. We were able to raise over 21,000 for Camp Kicking Bear. There's some people that actually made comments that they get sick of hearing about this kind of stuff and whatever else. I think they didn't understand that we're actually raising money. This Camp Kicking Bear is to me the number one children's organization that gets kids in the outdoors, their families, especially a lot of kids that don't have the opportunity to do so otherwise. June 11th, we'll, I'll have more details coming out about this, but you can email us for early registration. June 11th, it'd be midday, you know, like 11 to four type thing, 10 to five, 10 to four. What I do is there's 50 people that register for this. We give that all to Camp Kicking Bear. Well, it's a habitat day. We go out for a couple hours on the property and I show you some strategies that you can take home to your own land. Number three, we have a hunt raffle for 100 people. The, the registration for 50 people is $300. That gets you in the door to actually see the property and the land. $100 gets you in a hunt raffle times 100 people. We had uh, Leo from Lower Michigan. Had a uh, hunt last year, many memories, uh, end of uh, September for a couple days. Number four, Lots of door prizes, Matthews bows, blinds. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, we give away. Really good stuff for you, too. Kids are free. I think we had about 25, 30 kids last year. All proceeds, again, go to Kicking Bear. Every dollar, every dime we raise goes to Kicking Bear. We'll have some other auction. Last year, Chris B. came. We might have Kevin Smith, retired Major League Baseball player. I hear that Gary Suter, he's a NHL Hall of Famer. He might show up, too. So... There's some chance to meet there. And then, of course, Ray Howell. He was here last year. He delivered his testimony. It was an awesome, inspirational talk that he gave to everyone. Hope to see you there. Look for further details on the site and then the description for the video.